Welcome to HeartTube. My name is Jim Putnam. We've been doing a series of videos on a flowering plant of the month uh, for a little while now, and we thought we would throw out Laura Petalum here in March. Sometimes, depending on our weather, these would be more like the beginning of April, but it just kind of depends on our nighttime temperatures. As soon as we get some uh, moderate nighttime temperatures for a period of time, these flowers will start to open up. This is probably the most asked about plant in on the channel if we you know are using back general different backdrops on different videos you know if this one is in the back backdrop it's always going to be asked about this variety of laura petalum is called carolina midnight it's got fantastic purple foliage all the way through it it's got an almost reddish uh, frilly flower on it uh and it really is a big it but it gets big it gets big and this is kind of a funny thing in my time my 38 years in horticulture is originally uh, when I started there were just green uh, Laura Petalum with white flowers that got gigantic and a few uh, selections that had a little bit of reddish foliage right out on the tips but the rest of the plant down in the middle was green but when they were flushing out they had a little bit of red uh, new growth but they all you know they all flowered like this either white or purple and I did a landscape job years ago and I wish I had photos of it of a giant green one with white flowers that had, a tunnel had been created in it. Uh, the lady no has since um, uh, uh, no longer lives there and uh, that plant was taken out. But I wish I had photos of it back from my landscape days. So originally they got quite large and over time we've seen through plant breeding them shrink down, shrink down, shrink down. Some of the ones from the last 20 years were, you know, they th people thought they had them shrunk down to four and six feet, but some of those varieties get quite big. And we'll see some of that walking around the neighborhood. This is in the witch hazel family. These are in the witch hazel family, and they have these same frilly little, same frilly little flowers that you would see uh, on a witch hazel without the fragrance. And the witch hazels are, you know, most of those are pretty fragrant. But it's in that witch hazel family uh, in its own tribe. Uh, within the witch hazel family. Uh, Distillium, which I have down here below here, is also in the witch hazel family. So we have quite a few ornamental genuses within that witch hazel family. This uh, Laura Petalum is uh, as a combination of two Greek words that mean strap and petal. So you get that strap-like petal on the, uh, on the flowers. They're incredibly showy. This one, again, is blooming in March and then uh, typically uh, we'll go through the summertime and it'll bloom on temperature change in the fall. Not all of these flowers are open yet, uh, but typically we'll get some additional flowers in the fall as well. There are actually four species within the Loripetalum genus, but Loripetalum chinense is the one you will mostly uh, see out in, the, uh, out in the trade. This is probably the best of the dwarf Loripetalum at this point. This is purple daydream Loripetalum. It has this great spreading habit we basically have not cut on this thing in three years and every limb that looks like it's going to come up a bit and get, gain some height ends up just kind of weeping over in time it's pink but it's on the it's on the red side of pink uh, here it is it's almost in peak flower right now and again it'll flower again in the fall probably not quite as heavy as this but this is another one that has that purple foliage is pretty much throughout the entire plant. Uh, this one's maybe in a hair more shade, so it's a little bit greener. We'll see that as we walk around on some of them in the neighborhood where they're in a little too much shade, so even the purple ones can lose a bit of that, uh, the purple foliage ones can lose a bit of that color. Although it's a, uh, a Chinese native uh, sp uh, species, uh, they're not invasive at all. It's not something we uh, have to worry about uh, on Laura Petalum. They're just great really great ornamental plants. This is another Southern Living Plant Collection one, and this may be the actual funnest one to me, because again, when I started uh, in this business, you know, the Laura Petalum were green and, you know, had white, most of them, had white, you know, giant, giant growing trees. This is a, a semi-dwarf one called Emerald Snow, and this is as tall as it's gotten in three years, and trust me, other Laura Petalum <laughs> would get a lot taller than this in that amount of time, and, and I can simply, I have found cut two feet off of this thing and kind of keep it the same height pretty much permanently. It starts off kind of a, with a greenish flower that opens white and gets brighter and brighter and brighter. Then it's got this emerald green foliage that the new growth on it is kind of a light green and then the older growth is a much darker 
much darker green. This plant, I've said before in another video, is probably the most abused plant in this garden. It's been moved like three times. It was moved during the middle of the summer one time, and uh, it just didn't miss a beat, really. Uh, it just got right back to growing pretty quickly. Uh, after it wilted for a couple of days, but just a really great ornamental plant. And, you know, don't discount, you know, this green, this green variety with these bright white flowers. It's every bit as showy as these pink and red flowering cultivars that we have. This is a really spectacular planting of Lorepedalum. I'm not necessarily gonna know the names of the ones that we're, as we're walking around the neighborhood looking at. I believe though, this is likely Ruby. Ruby on any tag is gonna say, four to six feet, and it's certainly maintainable at that, but it'll try to get bigger over time. My ruby lorepedalum at the nursery that we took cuttings off of was at least 12 feet tall uh, by the time I left. And ruby will get a lot of the purple foliage and the new foliage, but some of the interior foliage will turn back green if it's shaded at all. But this is, a, is, is being maintained about three feet wide and about seven feet tall and a perfect box here along here. You have to be careful with the pruning on this. This has to be pruned like middle summer or late, you know, because it needs to put on a little bit of growth to be able to have this early spring flower like this. So you'd have to be careful if you were shearing them like this to make sure you were still gonna get flowers. We're having a fantastic year on the super early flowering stuff this year. Sometimes when these flowers are completely open like this, we'll get a, it, it, we're still at a time of year when this is happening that we could get a 25, 28 degree night for sure. Uh, and that would definitely hurt these open flowers, but we're just having a, an incredible year where all this early flowering stuff is able to open like this and put on this kind of show. We just saw those lower petal implanted with intent to shear them off, you know, at the size, you know, at the exact size they were using them for as a, a barrier out at the property edge. These on the other hand were planted you know, it's the wrong variety probably for the front of this house. And they're having to prune them, not to keep them boxed off, but to keep them from eating the house. <laughs> so, you know, it's definitely, there. we do have varieties now that you can use that would stay under these windows or maybe right up to these windows. Uh, but these, I would imagine, they're having to prune on them a lot over the course of a year. Because these, once they have a big root system on them, they can grow three, these larger growing varieties can grow four or five feet in a single season. This is definitely one of the dwarf ones, but they've been planted in quite a bit of shade so it's in the process of reaching where you know if they had full sun i think this is a again a, a lower spreading one but these are definitely i would call them full sun plants but i actually think they do the ones that we have in our garden are getting maybe six seven eight hours of direct sun and they're staying reasonably compact i think that's probably the sweet spot for them they'll again they'll take absolute full sun but I believe the sweet spot is not quite all day. Uh, and then you get, but if you go down below six hours or so, you'll notice that even the dwarf ones will try to stretch and get larger. And again, qu quite beautiful, but these were planted out here at the base of these steps with the intent of having them three or four feet tall. But that's just not going to happen when you're denying them this much direct sun. They're just going to reach up and try to get it, even the dwarf ones. It's kind of amazing to see some people will keep them just kind of meatballed like this the process of meatballing is definitely going to reduce the amount of flowers these were definitely pruned very late season and so the flowers that are here just the the ones along the branch that just happened to be missed at the time they were pruning them they're pretty daggone drought tolerant uh, once they are established so in, a, in an area where you're getting where you could get rain every month like the area that i live in um, once they're established, we, it's not really a plant that we would think about needing any extra water. These are up on a bank here. There's a giant oak tree behind them that's almost certainly competing with them. Uh, and in an elevated space, I guarantee you this, these aren't ever getting any additional water and they're doing just fine. Again, they're probably, you know, need to be allowed to come into their natural form a bit and they would look a bit better, but that's fine. These are acid loving plants. Uh, you know, really, again, very low maintenance, very few pests, deer resistant, rabbit resistant, a lot of those um, types of qualities that we look for in an ornamental plant. Uh, and now with just so many to choose from, we can really pick the right one to go into the spaces. It used to just be no choice on them and people bought them in full flower and then they put them in their woodlands or they put them in their front of their windows or they put them next to their driveways and you know where they had to constantly prune them. And so you see a lot of the older ones you know, being pruned on, 
but now if you went back and shopped for them again, you could actually pick one that pretty much gets to the right height for the right, for that spot. This one's super interesting and I showed it on a neighborhood tour recently. These are being, this was a larger growing variety that's being maintained about two feet high. And then it's weeping down over the wall. I had no idea these would do this, but this constant pruning, uh, they've had, they've been able to get them to grow down to the ground. It's quite striking. I think this one's on the sunnier side over here. So it's getting a little bit more light and maybe that late shearing over here has cost them a bit of flowers uh, off of it, but really, really neat one. Here are some that are definitely in too much shade and they look okay while they're flowering. And you'll see that the ones that have been denied light uh, are, they're greener than they would be otherwise. And you know, can have some other issues with root competition where they're off colored and that kind of thing. Uh, but they look okay. They look okay in flower. We see a bunch of these in the neighborhood that are, you know, under, you know, under tree canopies. Uh, and they're, I'm sure they're stretching a ton. You can see where they've cut these back a bunch because they're up against the sidewalk in too much shade and they're trying to stretch out. But, you know, even in low light when it's in full flower, it looks okay. But if I came back here in two or three weeks, you'd see that these don't look as good as they're kind of presenting themselves in full flower. We see several around the neighborhood where people are limbing them up into small trees. Uh, and this one is, you know, been limbed up about two, three feet at this point. Uh, it could continue just to be limbed up into a small tree. And this is a good example of it where it's been allowed to take its natural form, but it's been lifted up from the ground. And so it still has all the flowers and the shape and all the great characteristics of, uh, of a lower pedalum. I saw, we saw another one walking around where someone's trying to keep it such control over it that it's not, uh, it doesn't have any flowers on it uh, because it was pruned so late. So any, you know, you can limb this up and you can prune it after it flowers and then you could probably prune it about midsummer, and then you need to leave it alone if you want this type of flowering. Uh, anything after that, you're going to eliminate at least some of the flowers. Uh, but look, I mean, look at this thing in full bloom. So I think it'll be pretty noticeable that this purple daydream, Laura Betelum, has been in more sun. You can see just more Generally, it hasn't come into flower yet either, but it's, bu it's budded up. But you can see how much darker the foliage is than the one we have in the ground at the house. Because this one, again, is probably only getting about four or five hours of direct sun. It's still compact uh, and it, it looks great and it's in full bloom. But you can see if I gave it a little bit more sun, it would have a little bit more rich coloration in it. Uh, these lower petalum, I've always considered them hardy in zone seven to nine. You'll see seven to ten in some places, but I've spent a lot of time in you know, zone 10 locations in the country and I've really never seen any in the ground. So let me, let us know down below if you're in zone 10 and your Laura Petalum are, are doing okay. Cause I, I always thought that they probably needed a little bit of, little bit of cool weather in the winter to trigger, to trigger this flowering, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong on that. In zone seven, uh, you have to be careful with these out in wind. Uh, they, you know, these leafy evergreen plants like this, if you're in the marginal areas for them, regardless of what leafy evergreen it is, the winter wind could have an impact uh, on them and, and really burn them during the winter time. Maybe, maybe not necessarily kill them, but certainly cost you some flowers and you know not looking too spiffy here at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of spring every year. So, in zone seven, I'm definitely you know putting these in some sort of protected space with as much sun as you can give them. Uh, by the time you get to zone eight or nine, they can be out in open areas. So we've seen all kinds of uses around the neighborhood for these Laura Petalum. Uh, and again, because we have ones that all the way down to Purple Pixie, which is basically a ground cover and coming up to Purple Daydream and Ruby, which, you know, again, gets much bigger than the tag says, it still gets, it's not as big as some of the older varieties that get 25 feet tall. So there's a, you can get the appropriate plant for the appropriate space. They make great foundation plants as long as you're picking ones that are, you know, either if you're, if it's on a corner, you can do an upright one like Carolina Midnight. If it's under a window, you'd probably want to do Purple Daydream or that Emerald Snow. Laura Petalum on the other side of the garden over there. And then, um, and then of course the older varieties are great as screening plants. This is a fantastic screening plant. We have a na we're in an urban space here, very, um, very small lots really. Uh, and my neighbor, you know, just hangs out in his back garden right here on the other side of this. I wouldn't know it because <laughs> this Carolina Midnight Laura Petalum works great. And you saw uh, around, we saw around the corner where somebody's taking one that gets larger and, you know, keeping it slightly more sheared. Again, being careful when you're actually pruning it to make sure you're still getting flowers on it, but you can keep them slightly more sheared. 
slightly more sheared uh, and still get pretty good flowering on them as long as the timing's right. I'm gonna quickly demonstrate how I would prune one of these to keep kind of a natural form. Typically, I'd wait till after it finishes flowering, but I'm doing, it happens to be flowering today and I need to film this, so I'm gonna be taking off some flowers, which I wouldn't normally do. I am not the pruning police. If you wanna turn your lower petalum into meatballs, you just meatball them all day long. You can prune them every two weeks all summer long and just have at it. Uh, I'm not, again, not the pruning police, but you know, uh, it, there is a way to prune them and keep them, you know, in kind of a natural looking form and allow them to, you know, not allow them to make sure you continue to have full flower on them when they come into flower. So I just take the branches that are coming up higher than I want and I track them down in the plant some. So rather than cutting them right to the top of the plant where this is such a vigorous branch, it's just gonna come right back up really quickly. Instead, I track it down into the plant a bit and cut it just above another, just above another side branch, uh, just like that, okay? And again, I've cut off a ton of flowers. <laughs> no one's gonna like to see this video at all anymore. This video, uh, this video just went to uh, Jim's, Jim's terrible pruning video uh, on Laura Petalum, but I'll track these things back down into the plant a bit and leave, uh, try to leave, uh, this one's more difficult. I'm trying to prune them just at a branch to where you really can't tell I pruned that off. Uh, it's because it's got the side branches still sitting there. And I might go through here and, you know, take a couple more off. But I'm trying to just keep it in this kind of natural growth habit. There's probably a couple more I would take off here or there. But again, I'm just trying to cut them right to where a side branch happens so that really you can't see that cut that I made on it. Uh, and it keeps it in slightly more of a natural form. And it'll flush out as soon as it finishes flowering. Again, I would have done this two weeks from now after it finished flowering, but I exposed a lot of flowers on it actually. Um, and you want to do one thing or other thing about pruning these, if they're out in the full sun, if I, I can prune them in the end of March after they finish flowering or April or early May. Once we get past that period of time, if I did what I just did, I would expose all this foliage to full sun and it'd probably burn. Uh, I'd probably get some burned leaves on it. Wouldn't hurt the plant in the long run, but it would make it look, um, look a little strange. So one thing about pruning, the one thing, one thing that these Laura Petalum are, uh, one issue they have is bacterial gall, which is, it basically, where I sometimes, you know, when you prune something, it'll have a little wound on it, a um, little puffy kind of wound on it. That's what bacterial gall looks like. Uh, once you have it, the plants actually need to be disposed of. There's really no cure for it. The way it's spread, though, is mechanically. Okay, so this pair of pruners right here, if I had gall on one, uh, I would be moving it over to another. So if I had, if you have Laura Petalum and they're really something you very much like and you have a landscape service, I would probably tell them not to prune them because if they're bring, they could easily be bringing it on their pruners from one plant to another. So keep that in mind. That's the way it's spread is by pruning one that has it and moving it to another one. There you go. There's Laura Petalum. Um, and I always, it's always funny because somehow I end up saying Laura Petalum so many times on this channel and it gets, it's been, it's been talked about over the years and I've never uh, done kind of an all about uh, Laura Petalum video. Emerald Snow is absolutely one of my favorites. Don't discount these white flowering varieties. Is there a particular a variety of Laura Petalum that's your favorite? Let us know down below the video and thanks for following along.